Hi, my name is Sterling Baird, and I'm going to be taking you through a series of tutorials describing how to use advanced Bayesian optimization topics. Now, if you don't know what Bayesian optimization is right now, that's okay. Uh, a lot of traditional methods for searching for some optimal performance, uh, whether you're looking at a machine learning model or you're running experiments in a, in a wet lab or running simulations somewhere, uh, pretty much every uh, real world task has some notion of best that we want to optimize for, at least in the physical sciences. Um, and what I'll be presenting on is adaptive experimentation for the physical sciences. Um, so I'll be making a lot of connections from the optimization framework and these mathematical concepts to the real world experiments that will be uh, that scientists will perform. Uh, now, traditionally, there are things like grid search or random search uh, that can be used, and of course, human intuition uh, in guiding the choice of uh, new materials or new molecules uh, and so forth. Um, and I'll show how Bayesian optimization methods and these adaptive experimentation methods uh, that build models and look to leverage existing information to inform future predictions and the next suggestions uh, can be dramatically more efficient than your typical grid search or, or random search. So let's jump right in. So, like I said, adaptive experimentation for science. Uh, this is a more efficient type of design of experiments. Um, and I'll be using just in the beginning a couple analogies uh, to X. And interestingly, the name of the framework that I'll be presenting on uh, or pulling a lot of examples from is also named X uh, by Meta, formerly Facebook, uh, the Adaptive Experimentation or X platform. So we've got grid and random search, uh, which might be like your typical hatchet. We've got quasi random search, uh, which might be the efficiency of a chainsaw, for example. And then we have adaptive experimentation, um, which can be likened to a tiger cat. Now, if you don't know what a tiger cat is, uh, I think they're pretty cool. Let's take a look. Um, so you can see here, uh, <laughs> it's very efficiently removing trees, uh, chopping them up into uh, different segments, uh, and uh, you're getting a dramatic improvement. And with that, of course, comes the complexity of requiring operators, the machinery, um, and so forth. So here, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, a couple things. So uh, we've got grid and random search. And in a 2D plane, if you have two different parameters um, and you have three samples along each parameter, then you get nine points in your grid search. Um, and you could also do the same where you choose nine points randomly uh, using some random sampling algorithm uh, to uh, get your points as well. However, both of these methods suffer from uh, this sparsity in the space, these regions or gaps where you don't have very much data. Um, and it gets worse as you move to more and more parameters. So. Well, it might not look so bad in two dimensions once you're in six or 10 or 15 dimensions, uh, things can really uh, start to get, get pretty bad in terms of that sparsity. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, then we have quasi-random search methods, which uh, do a better job of evenly spreading out the points in a way that you don't get the systematic gaps that grid search gives you, um, and you also don't get the really large random pockets that random search gives you. Um, and then, of course, we have adaptive experimentation. Uh, one of the most efficient forms of adaptive experimentation is Bayesian optimization. Now, this involves creating a model uh, based on your data that can quantify the uncertainty in your predictions as well as sort of the average uh, predictions uh, that you get, and then using what's called an acquisition function, which I'll describe later, uh, in order to suggest the next best experiment to run or the next set of experiments that you should run. So first, I'm going to talk about uh, these more traditional methods, grid and random search and quasi-random search. And we'll jump into a notebook, our first tutorial notebook for this. In this first tutorial, 
my main goal is to convince you that the quasi random search methods that I mentioned are almost always more effective and why uh, they're almost always more effective. So uh, first we're gonna import some uh, different tools that we will use, NumPy, Pandas, uh, Plotly for some plotting, uh, scipy.stats to get some of these quasi-random sampling methods, uh, and just a little function for uh, saving our plots. So uh, we'll start out with that two uh, parameter search space where our two parameters are x1 and x2, and these can are allowed to vary between zero and one. And we'll start off saying that we're gonna sample 10 uh, samples from each of these different search spaces. And the traditional design of experiments, search methods that don't use a model to try to predict and suggest the next experiment, but instead just sort of sample all at once, uh, without that predictive capability, those are typically referred to as uninformed uh, search algorithms or sampling methods. Uh, so here we'll start out with grid sampling and we'll use scikit-learn uh, to help us with assembling that parameter grid. Um, so here we'll define uh, the number of points along each dimension based on the requested number of samples. We'll round this down uh, since when you're doing grid sampling you have to choose uh, finite um, numbers of samples uh, based on uh, how many parameters you have and how many samples you want uh, so essentially your grid size uh, so we'll automatically calculate that uh, and then uh, create along each dimension uh, our choices and finally return this parameter grid. So when we run this, see that uh, we get our, our grid of samples uh, with three points along each dimension. And if we go ahead and plot that, we'll see our nine points uh, that we'd expect. Same with random, similarly with random sampling, uh, we'll just uh, use a NumPy random number generator uh, within the bounds and request the number of samples that we want, in this case, 10. Uh, and uh, we can also visualize that uh, when we see the, the random samples. Then we get into Latin hypercube sampling. Now this uses SciPy, uh, a popular um, scientific Python computing framework. Uh, and we'll use the quasi Monte Carlo generators uh, class here or module. Um, and so with the Latin hypercube, uh, we'll also use some optimization here. Uh, if we take a look at that, it's whether or not to use an optimization scheme to construct the Latin hypercube sample. And essentially what that means is it's going to try to uh, perform some internal optimization to make sure that the uh, the uniformity is, is good or, or nice. Um, so uh, and we'll uh, sample however many, many samples we want. Um, and then we can rescale these so that it, uh, you know, if we're not going from zero to one, uh, if our parameters were negative five to 10, for example, then we can rescale those appropriately. Um, we can go ahead and do that. And uh, again, take a look at the visualization here. Um, and we're seeing that it's, uh, fairly uh, well spread out. You don't get these really large pockets. You don't get these systematic pockets. Um, and then we have another type of sampling, Sobel sampling, uh, Sobel sequences. Uh, and these are another way to generate uh, these uniform uh, sets of points. And uh, with Sobel sampling, uh, if you want a statistical guarantee that you get that uniformity, then you have to sample uh, in powers of two. So uh, two squared or two to the third, two to the, two to the fourth and so on. And we can take a look at each of these sampling methods uh, for different numbers of samples. Pull it all together into a comparison data frame and uh, plot it here. 
And what we see here uh, is just that as we get to uh, fewer samples in the data limited regime, uh, we tend to end up with uh, more of the pockets. Um, but you can also get an idea um, of, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of explain why I'm, I'm plotting this here because we're going to talk about a statistical quantification of that uniformity or that sparsity, uh, which is referred to as discrepancy. Uh, so if we take a look at uh, some higher dimensions where we take a one-dimensional case, a two-dimensional case, and a three-dimensional case, and we can just take a look at that, you know, essentially a number line, a 2D grid, um, and then a, uh, oh, that's too bad. Um, a 3D grid of points. And we take a look at this discrepancy value, um, then, uh, you know, which I described it here, it's a uniformity criterion to use to assess the space filling of a number of samples. If we take a look at that, as we go uh, to higher dimensions, we'll see that the discrepancy gets worse or bigger uh, in the higher dimensions. So there were, uh, in this grid search, there was always, there were always three points along each dimension. So we had three points on the number line and nine points on the 2D grid and 27 points on the 3D grid. Uh, but even though we're scaling exponentially uh, how many samples we're using, the space filling properties are getting worse in the higher dimensions. Uh, and this, uh, this relates to the fact that the diagonal along a square is longer than the side length and then the diagonal along a cube is even bigger. And so you, as you move to higher dimensions, you get even bigger and bigger pockets uh, in those, those in-between regions. Uh, next, we'll take a look at the discrepancies for each of the plots that I showed you above. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit. So uh, along, uh, the, the leftmost column, that's grid search. Then we have random search, Latin hypercube, and Sobel sampling. And then 100 samples starting up top, going down to five samples at the bottom. With the discrepancies here, uh, first, let's take a look at the trend going from left to right. So we have around 0 0.004 and then 0 0.003. Um, and then we get smaller and smaller for uh, some of these quasi-random methods. Um, and then we also get higher discrepancies as we have fewer points, uh, essentially less space filling. Um, and that trend holds uh, where the quasi-random methods have lower discrepancies, or in other words, they're more uniformly distributed than the grid and random search. Now, of course, we could tell that visually, but when we're in higher dimensions and we can't visualize that, discrepancy can be a useful statistical measure, and it's also useful to be able to quantify it uh, explicitly um, rather than just kind of taking a look and uh, deciding if something looks uniform enough or not. And we can also take a look at the discrepancies. So like I mentioned, uh, we can't visualize these really high dimensions, um, but we can look at the discrepancy in these higher dimensions. Um, so if we look at two dimensions, uh, we'll see that Latin hypercube sampling uh, has the lowest discrepancy followed by Sobel, followed by a really large jump to random and then a fairly large jump to grid from random uh, where the Latin hypercube is uh, about, let's see, an order of magnitude. Uh, looks like uh, one or two orders of magnitude uh, lower. And then as we move to the, these higher dimensions, uh, we see that for, say, 10 dimensions, uh, the differences are, are also um, present there, where the quasi-random methods 
um, are doing a much better job at space filling uh, than the sort of traditional design of experiments, you know, grid search or something like that, um, those methods. And this one was looking at 10 samples, uh, which is very sparse in 20 dimensions, for example. So you essentially only have uh, you know, one grid point <laughs> uh, because uh, you don't have enough samples to put multiple along each dimension. Um, but even as we increase that to a lot, much larger number of samples, we still see a similar trend where uh, the, the grid and random search just aren't able to keep up with the uniformity of these quasi-random methods. So that concludes this comparison of grid and random search with uh, two quasi-random methods, Latin hypercube and Sobel sampling. And hopefully this has convinced you that the Latin hypercube sampling and the Sobel sampling are both much better at doing uniform space filling in both low and high dimensions uh, when you're uh, deciding on kind of an initial broad sampling of points.